I'm Andy Livengood. I understand that without proper planning, a show can go bad. Hazard preparedness in real life is even more important. From sea level rise and flooding to insurance and earthquakes, I'll help cut through the jargon and make preparing for a disaster so easy, even a comedian can do it. This is Hazard. When the skies open up and the rain comes down, I always think it's kind of funny how people just immediately run for cover, as if the falling drops are like little water bombs threatening a bad hair day or soggy socks. <laughs> really, when you think about it, the much bigger risk for us is what happens to the rain after it hits the ground. Why'd that have to be on pitcher day? You see, rain and snow are natural parts of the water cycle. In a natural environment, much of this precipitation will filter through the ground and return to the water table. The rest continues across the ground as runoff, is used by native vegetation, or evaporates into the air from bodies of water and plants. Natural runoff, usually the result of terrain or compacted or saturated soil, is an important function of the water cycle. It allows water to reach lakes, rivers, and oceans. The roofs, roads, and driveways that cover much of the landscape in urban and suburban areas, however, prevents the rainwater from soaking into the ground or being used by plants. This causes more runoff than would naturally occur. Think of these surfaces like an unnecessary bodyguard. No! <laughs> this excess stormwater runoff can overwhelm our drainage system, causing flash flooding and carrying potential pollutants that end up in our water bodies, making your day at the river a little unpleasant. Look who's back! <laughs> Found you! <laughs> oh, I love reunions, I always cry. <laughs> Ooh, what you reading? Boring! Uh, hey, you need a bookmark? <laughs> Spoiler alert, the butler did it. <laughs> Where are you going? We're just having fun. Now this is living. <laughs> In most areas, stormwater is not treated, making city runoff the leading source of water pollution in estuaries and the third largest polluter of lakes in America. According to a 2017 report to Congress, population growth and city expansion turn up the pressure on city leaders to find a solution for the higher rates of polluted stormwater runoff. More people means more pollution and more demand for clean water. This generates the ever-increasing necessity to figure out how to deal with stormwater runoff. So the next time we dodge raindrops and take cover, perhaps we should use this occasion to consider where all the stormwater is running off to. It's time every citizen takes an active role in reducing and cleaning our stormwater runoff, because our lives and our children's lives depend on it. Every last drop. The good news is the country has come a long way in protecting our water sources using a mix of traditional and modern techniques. Stormwater management historically focused solely on moving water out of the cities. Gradually, the focus shifted, putting more emphasis on managing the quality of stormwater runoff. Today, the priorities work in tandem and with floodplain management across entire watersheds as part of a comprehensive stormwater management system. A floodplain is the low-lying area adjacent to a body of water that floods from time to time. A watershed is an area that channels precipitation into larger water bodies. Since stormwater drains empty into oceans, successful development strategies used in floodplains must consider stormwater management. In the same way, since floodplains are the natural receptacles of stormwater, successful stormwater management must consider the use of floodplains. The two systems work hand in hand to decrease pollution and get the water where it needs to go. But to really understand where we are, it's helpful to look at where we came from. 
The management of storm water for human use and consumption dates back to the first human settlements established thousands of years ago. Later, early Americans would handle stormwater runoff individually or in small groups, if they did anything at all. Combined sewer systems were introduced in 1855. This approach mixed sewage with rainwater and runoff before sending to water bodies. Modern cities use separate systems to manage sewer and stormwater as a more effective way to deal with runoff. By the turn of the 20th century, people knew the dangers of polluted water, but for much of the country, the use of lakes and rivers as dumping grounds remained status quo. Many things contributed to the contamination, but it was industrial and population growth in and around cities that raised the visibility of the issue. A notorious example occurred on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. In the early 20th century, the river was an industrial hub and dumping ground. It was so polluted that in 1936, the water actually caught fire. The incident was the first of many fires the river would see over the next three decades. By 1948, Congress passed the first major legislation that would try to set up some sort of standard for decreasing water pollution. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948, however, was limited on scope and weak on enforcement, and clearly wasn't enough. In 1969, more than 20 years after the initial fire, another blaze erupted on the Cuyahoga. Though it wasn't the worst fire to flare up on the river, it occurred when the country was primed to move into a new era of environmentalism. Cleveland became a symbol of America's water pollution problem. Three years later, the Clean Water Act set the stage for modern water regulation in our country and eventually put pressure on local municipalities to take responsibility for their own backyards. Modern cities now devote major resources and funding to effective water management, organizing dedicated departments to address stormwater runoff, pollution, and flooding. But clean water is everyone's business, including yours. Stick with us, this is Hazard. see on page four that the projections need to be blood next Thursday? Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh-uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So. I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate. The family's visit to the forest inspired a beautiful question. Mother, mother, am I a tree? You tell me to stand tall. You tell me to stay rooted. I think I am a tree. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. When it comes to making plans, you are the best. The same way you plan each detail for those moments, start planning to protect you and your loved ones from a natural disaster. Protecting your family is the best plan you can make. A new decade promised a new attitude about the impact of human activity on the Earth. The Cleveland River fire was an image that could not be ignored, and it became a symbol of a much larger problem. In 1970, the year of the first National Earth Day, President Nixon authorized the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. Soon after came the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, otherwise known as the Clean Water Act. The act empowers the EPA to regulate pollutant discharges into U.S. waters by issuing permits to regulate and monitor what can be discharged into water bodies, and also setting standards and rules for pollution control for industry, agriculture, municipalities, and individuals. Best practices for water management continue to evolve. Over the next few decades, water studies showed that the traditional method of wastewater dilution was not effective in lessening river and ocean pollution. Cities gradually shifted to dealing with wastewater and stormwater runoff separately. 
stormwater would be filtered at the source using natural techniques instead of being treated as sewage. While the federal government sets national standards for water quality, effective management of stormwater runoff occurs at the state and local levels as communities face different risks. Stormwater managers play an important role in the development of modern cities. So a stormwater program manager is to focus on the non-point source pollutions of an area, which is really just rainfall, not specifically draining out of one person's pipe. It's the public infrastructure that's paid for with taxes or any other type of resources. Stormwater is unique in our area because of the flat terrain and the ever-changing marshlands and estuaries, the runoff from the upland areas, and how it's impacted with development and even during rain events, significant events that can change that terrain. In the sense of regulating development, the stormwater program is the effects of development on the landscape, and it is the long-term inspections and enforcement of upkeeping those best management practices put in place for that development in the initial construction phase forever. Stormwater program management is different from floodplain management in the sense that they have different objectives. Stormwater program management has traditionally been the sediment and erosion control pollution prevention programs, the non-point source pollutions. Traditionally, floodplain management is a during construction and post construction component of a government entity. Stormwater program management is for quantity and quality of water runoff, and floodplain management is the storm surge, slosh model, set elevations throughout an area, regardless of during construction activity. City planning is brought to the table in order to help make sure that infrastructure is in place to support any future development, and if needed, to make the corrections now and create special regulations for those areas, called special protection areas, for quality and quantity of water runoff. Studying and protecting watersheds is an important task of the stormwater manager. But in the face of growing population and increased rain events, innovation will be key in dealing with stormwater runoff and the pollutants it collects. The EPA estimates that more than $271 billion will be needed to bring the nation's stormwater management systems up to date. Given this colossal undertaking, leaders seek additional ways to deal with runoff. Communities now look to an untapped resource to support efforts for a better drainage system and cleaner water. You. This is Hazard. Severe weather can strike anytime, anywhere, but there's a simple way to stay safe. Hey, Jim Cantori here. I stay safe in dangerous weather by planning ahead. You can stay safe too with a few easy steps. Build an inexpensive kit with supplies for your family's needs. Write down important information like phone numbers and medications. Always talk with your family and remember any pets in your planning. Be ready, be safe. Start your plan today at ready.gov plan. When you look at the number of disasters in the U.S., chances are every area will deal with some kind of emergency in the next decade. And between school, sports, and social lives, chances are you won't be with your kids when it happens. Will they know what to do? Ready.gov slash kids has the educational tools and information to make the conversation easy. When the time comes, chances are they'll feel prepared, not scared. So talk with your family today. South Carolina. We actually don't have a paid litter program. Our state roads are maintained by volunteers. Adopt a Highway's mission is to eradicate litter. That means by like picking up litter along our roadways. And in Charleston County, we have about 102 groups that have adopted the roadways. The roadways are about two miles long and we do litter cleanups five times a year. We rely so much on volunteers to keep the Adopt a Highway program running. 
Dumpster Fryer has a little bit more of a broader focus. We not only do litter cleanups, but we also work with city and town councils to um, pass legislation that's beneficial for conservation and marine preservation. We're very grassroots and hands-on, and if somebody wants to partner with us, we'll provide all the supplies, we'll come out, we'll lead the cleanup, and hopefully educate folks to not throw down the trash. A lot of folks, when they're doing a litter cleanup, they look straight ahead, but if you look down as you're walking, unfortunately, everywhere in Charleston, you see small pieces of litter. And one of the items that we find most often is cigarette butts. A lot of folks don't think that cigarette butts are a problem for the environment because back in the day, years ago, they were made of cotton. They are no longer made of cotton. They're actually made of a type of rayon, which is made of plastic. This plastic, again, doesn't biodegrade. It doesn't break down, which is why you see all these little pieces that look like cotton. That is a part of the plastic that holds on to all the chemicals, the nicotine, the toxins that you smoke, and then it's thrown onto the ground and washed into our marshes, and all that leaches in. Little tiny pieces of plastic are just as detrimental as large pieces. We have to control single-use plastic, and we have to control the amount of litter that ends up on our roadways and in our marshes. I love to say this, we all live downstream. South Carolina is a coastal state. It doesn't matter if you're up in Greenville or if you're inland or in the upstate. We all live downstream. Litter is going to make its way into a waterway where you see our dolphins swim, you see our turtles, and you go fishing with your family. Anything that is on the side of the road, anything that is sitting around in the neighborhood, if it doesn't actually just dump into the waterway, into the river, it's going to go down that storm drain and there's nothing to block it. That eventually makes its way into our waterways. Being a coastal state, we have to keep in mind that our livelihood depends on clean ocean, clean water. So keeping our marshes clean, whether it's a low-lying area in the upstate or in Charleston, is it's, it's important, vitally important. Everybody can make a difference. Like walk out of your door, look down when you're walking your dog or you're going for a jog, just make a decision. Pick up one piece of litter, just try it. It'll make a difference if everybody does it. Do you have a dog, a septic tank? How about a home garden? If so, you may be a part of a group of some big water pollutants. Data put together by the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control and supported by Charleston Waterkeeper shows that bacteria, including fecal matter and E. coli, are the biggest polluters in the Ashley and Cooper Rivers Basin. This basin serves the area in and around Charleston County, South Carolina. Much of the fecal matter, that's poop you guys, came from dogs and faulty septic tanks. Yard debris is also a source of pollution, so make sure you bag up your leaves so the garbage trucks can collect it. In fact, there are many different and surprising ways we may be actually creating polluted stormwater runoff. Polluted stormwater runoff is largely considered the number one threat to clean water in the United States. Whenever rain falls on the built environment, it falls oftentimes on an impervious surface and that water is unable to infiltrate. It's unable to soak into the ground and so it becomes stormwater runoff. It runs off of the landscape. As it's running off, uh, it has the potential to pick up um, pollutants that we've left behind. Gas and oil from a car that maybe wasn't properly maintained, bacteria from a failing septic system, plastic bags, excess fertilizers, the list goes on and on. And that's really what concerns us is as we get more and more polluted stormwater runoff into our local water resources, we see those water resources start to degrade. Stormwater runoff is regulated. Your local governments uh, work tirelessly to manage stormwater and to prevent, first and foremost, from a community health perspective, to prevent flooding and to move stormwater to a place where it can be managed. A big part of what our local communities are doing is educating communities on the role that we as residents all play in managing stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff 
is not inherently bad. It's going to happen. We do not want water going through our roofs. But what we want to do is we want to try to manage that water in a way that protects our water quality and also looks at water quantity. As residents, we can think about it in a way that, you know, every drop counts. So the water that falls on my property, I'm gonna take some ownership for that water and I'm gonna allow that water an opportunity to slow down and to infiltrate. The reason that that's important is we all remember learning about the water cycle when we were in school and water infiltrates into the ground, it becomes groundwater. That's a big part of the water cycle. And if we don't allow water to infiltrate, um, over time we can see our groundwater depleted and the potential to become polluted stormwater runoff and impact those surface water bodies such as our rivers and lakes and streams and beaches. So it's an important that we take ownership for how we manage our property and for us all to be stewards of our water resources and help our local governments, our state governments, our federal governments, and all of the other you know, state agencies and nonprofit organizations who are working towards you know, clean water for today's generations and those of the future. To learn more about ways in which you can help protect your local water resources, visit clemson.edu slash extension slash Carolina Clear. As the universal solvent, water has the power to dissolve in part almost everything it comes in contact with. Garbage, rocks, witches who just want a pair of ruby slippers. <laughs> The stormwater that flows over rooftops, through gutters, across driveways and highways picks up all kinds of questionable riffraff on its way to rivers and oceans. This water pollution can be difficult to detect and trace because it lurks below the surface, often among bottom sediments or within animals that live in water. The water is capable of dissolving trash, the pollutants don't just magically disappear. Do you like magic tricks? Great! Take this garbage. I need to borrow your ordinary bottle of water. Oh, and it is gone! It's gone! Illusion. Said another way, tiny particles of every pile of poop every cigarette butt, every plastic, has a good chance of ending up directly in our oceans. Which is why I avoid the beach. That and I look ridiculous in a bathing suit. <laughs> the key takeaway, cleaner land equals cleaner water. Many organizations exist to motivate environmental consciousness, but there's an easy thing you can do on your own too. Simply, when you see trash, pick it up. Hi, pick that sorry. up! Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Is there recycling here? Hey guys, it's me, Isabella Gomez, filling in for Smokey Bear because he's got more to say than just... Only you can prevent wildfires. Like, if you're outside enjoying a barbecue, don't let a hamburger distract you from fire safety. Make sure you aren't dumping your hot coals or ashes onto the ground because that could start a wildfire. So take wildfire prevention seriously and let's save the world one day at a time. Juntos con Smokey Bear, podemos hacerlo. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention.
the importance of clean water is as old as life on Earth. But as the human population grows, the more we need to actively clean our resource instead of relying on Mother Nature to do all the work. As a society, our respect for rivers and oceans has morphed dramatically in the past several decades. In many ways, we've become the caretaker of water instead of simply a user. It is important for municipalities to pay close attention to the runoff and sewage that is dumped into state waterways. The federal government allows the local bodies who qualify to regulate their own stormwater management systems. But this regulation is only part of the equation. Every citizen needs to accept responsibility for their impacts on stormwater runoff by cleaning up litter, animal feces, and yard debris, as well as using natural landscapes to allow stormwater to infiltrate the ground. All this work will have a direct impact on our environment. Even now, the EPA is analyzing a survey of approximately 1,800 rivers and streams in our country. The results, set to be released in 2021, will hopefully show great progress towards cleaner water goals. You can find out more at epa.gov slash National Aquatic Resource Surveys. Water is everyone's business, and it's important that we endeavor to protect every last drop. Thanks for watching. This is Hazard. I th we need something that like shows like uh, something that communicates water, like a hipster just bathing himself over and over again. Here we have a North American hipster bathing himself at a local watering hole. Oh no, he senses a predator. Are you prepared for the disaster? This hipster is. He's living off the grid. He has to find his gauges in the wilderness. Those used to be acorns. Ah, I'm caught on a fish hook. I'm caught on a fish hook. This is not a joke. <laughs> You know, they personify a lot of things in this book, but I think it's just uh, over the top. I think people get it. <laughs>